So, this morning we're going to be in Isaiah 66. This morning we're going to be in Isaiah 66. And the last time the message was titled, Not the Answer Anticipated. We talked about prayer, we talked about contextually with the children of Israel, we talked about even how we you know, pray to God, and sometimes we get a yes, sometimes we get a yes, but wait, sometimes we get a no, sometimes we get silence for a while. So the last two sermons really had a lot to do, if you're going through a difficult time, I would encourage you to get them for free off the website, because certainly we're looking at the books contextually, but we are also um, looking at believers throughout the generations. God's truths are timeless, and that's why the Bible is called the living word. Uh, this morning, the title is called Inevitable Paths, and it's raining out, it's kind of cold and gloomy. <clears throat> I don't know what you're doing at the end of today, but you're probably anticipating things that are going on during the week, and here's the truth. You could look at the news and see the, the kookiness of our culture just heating up, the division, the strife, um, the plans of humanity, of a humanistic society largely moving towards, but at the end of the day, what we have to keep in mind is the fact that whatever you're thinking of, you have a project at work, you have a surgery coming up, you have uh, things in your life, when you really put your nose in the book, what you find that everything is going to shake out to two paths, right? The one path is the wide path that leads to everlasting destruction, which many find, unfortunately. The other path is the narrow path that leads to everlasting life, and Jesus said, few find it, which I can only surmise from that, that means there's less of a percentage. Uh, so whatever we do in life, what we have to do is keep eternity in mind, because this is what everything boils down to. And I think as Christians, in our fast-paced culture, we can get confused too, we can get distracted, but the bottom line is that, um, you know, what our desire should be, I mean, if we're Christians, we're going to be with the Lord, He's promised that, but our desire should be, the more we really understand the word, is that those that we love, or even strangers that we meet, and God puts a love in our heart for them, that they would be there too. And when you understand these concepts in the scripture, you act accordingly. You know, you, that is your overarching theme, no matter what's going on in your life, because when all this ends and all this is gone, it's just going to be God and souls, and uh, the remaking of everything, and that's really exciting. So... We, are, we went through 66 chapters in Isaiah. And I've got to be honest with you, it's just a thing with me, uh, but when I go through a very long book, and I've been teaching it for over a year, a little sad at the end. I'm going to miss Isaiah, you know what I'm saying? There's some concepts in here that we maybe not cover for a while. Uh, we're going to go into the book of Romans after this, completely different subject matter. So you might hear some re repetition from the pulpit in Isaiah, but savor that because we may not cover that in a while. So this is going to be two sermons and broken up this morning into three parts. So let's jump in. Isaiah 66, starting with verse 1. God through the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest for all those things my hand has made? And all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Uh, and who trembles at my word. He who kills a bull as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. Sounds pretty horrible, but we're going to explain that. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood, and he who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. Just as they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions and bring their fears upon them, because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, and they did evil before my eyes, and chose that in which I do not delight. So one out of three this morning is that religion... Rituals, rites, don't save. And that's very, you know, sometimes it's easier, I find, to witness to an atheist than to witness to somebody who's in a religion or denomination and they think that's going to save them. 
could be a family thing, could be generations, and they're so entrenched in this belief system that maybe they'll look at me and go, well, you don't have a collar, you don't have a robe, you don't have a hat, you don't have a staff. Read what Jesus says in Matthew 23. Those things mean absolutely nothing. So this is a hard message for some people to digest, but I'm going to take it apart. You see, these rites and rituals that were prescribed in the Old Testament, even some in the New Testament, had meaning behind them. And what God was saying, when you take the meaning out of things that are supposed to bring you closer to me, it's empty. It's cold. It's callous, especially when it came to some of these sacrifices. So first off, he says, in verse 1, God says, heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Who can really build God a house? Is God homeless? Of course not. God made everything. The temple was for the people's benefit, not for God's benefit. Here's the problem with religion, and this is insidious and it can happen over time, is when we do religious things and we think we're doing God a favor. Oh, I did that. God must be really pleased with me. Like you're helping God out for some reason, right? Things are, should be instituted to get us closer to the living God and to have our sins atoned for. Verse 2b, he says, on this one I will look. What kind of person does God favor? Well, if you look at the news, you might think he favors rich people, he might favor educated people. None of that stuff is in here. What does God look at? He doesn't care about your degrees. He doesn't care about you know, your social, the 2,000 friends on social media. What he cares about are these things, that you have a humble spirit, right? Poor, Jesus spoke about the poor in, in spirit. He's speaking about humility. That the person is contrite, which means that we go before the Lord and, you know, we kind of give up the goods, right? We, we just say to him, we're remorseful. When we've done something wrong, we, we don't try to manipulate God. I mean, who can really do that? He sees our heart. And that the one who trembles at God's word. Religion is useless, quite frankly. If you go to a church and they never use scripture, it's not a church. It's a social club or it's something else, but it isn't a church. You look at the Acts church and the early church, they got together to study God's word. Trembles at God's word. I thought about what I do here or what the other pastors do here for a moment. You know how many times I go over my notes? I don't know if it's because I have OCD or I tremble at God's word or maybe a little bit of both, but I don't want to say the wrong thing up here. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not like walking up here and my knees are knocking. That wouldn't be good today. <laughs> but I, I come up here and the other pastors and elders, and they come up here and they're so concerned that they're saying the right thing. And that's why you all have Bibles there. I've been corrected before. Maybe I misspoke or misquoted something, and I, and I like that, and we try, to, we try to fix it before it gets onto the website with the equipment that we have. We make mistakes, but the, the heart is that, that God's Word is so important that we don't want to mess it up, that we don't want to give the wrong message from the pulpit. Is that us? Are we even familiar with God's Word? Verse 3 expresses how wrong religion, rites, and rituals can be done with the wrong heart. It's actually tantamount to murder if we go through these things. So there were offerings, there were things that they offered back then, and uh, to offer a bull and do it just as a rite or a ritual, as if God looks at it as if you, you killed a person. Ne next one in three is he who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a, dog neck, a dog's neck. So what God is saying here is that you're just needlessly doing things to animals uh, because your heart's not in it. You're really not doing it for atonement. Your you're really, your heart's not for me. Uh, so he makes these you know, shocking comparisons. And when we look at the scripture, sometimes we are shocked, especially in our politically correct culture. Is that really supposed to say that? God's not politically correct. He tries to get our attention sometimes. And he does it very effectively. I'll tell you on a side note, I'm an animal lover. I love all animals. And there's provisions in scripture to actually care for your animals. People who are animal abusers and call themselves Christians, I really question that because, you know, God put animals here for a reason, uh, not to be abused. So he's saying, you're doing these things, and, and because it's not done the right way, you're, you're really hurting these animals, and you're, it's tantamount to murder. So religion really means nothing. Now, some of you might have come in here and say, you know, I'm not familiar with this church. Why do you keep talking about religion? 
Because what I'm doing is, the assumption is made that everybody here understands the Old Testament sacrificial system. These were religious rites and rituals that the people were doing, that God was saying through his prophet, you're not doing it with the right heart. You want to see how dangerous religion can be? In the New Testament, read Matthew 23. Jesus speaks all about these religious leaders of the first century who were not genuine. They were disingenuous when it comes to God. And they had the robes, and they had the... And the the prayers out in the marketplace, and people looked up, they got the best seats at the feasts. I mean, you could see that today in the religious echelon, right? The, we covered this last Sunday where uh, the religious one says, I am holier than you. Well, that's where we get the term holier than thou, right? In our vernacular, it's from Isaiah. Because God didn't want there to be this incredible hierarchy with a, a chasm between the clergy and the people. So these are all, it's all about religion. It's, you just check it out, it's right there. Verse 4, he speaks about the delusion <clears throat> that he would bring upon those that were deluding themselves. When we reject God, you know, we delude ourselves, right? You could see this in the Old Testament in Pharaoh, let, trying to let the, you know, or wanting, or God wanting Pharaoh to let the children of Israel leave Egypt. And what happened was God would allow these plagues and things to happen, and Pharaoh would say, okay, I'll let them go. Then he would tell his guards, don't let them go. Something else would happen, he'd say, oh, yeah, let them go. And he'd tell the army, don't let them go. He was playing games. So God, no problem. He, del he caused Pharaoh to remain in a hardened state in his delusion. So we speak about, we see delusion a lot, and those that think religion can save or being part of a denomination, they're also deluded. How, does, how do you get to heaven? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. All right? If I could read, talking about delusion, this is a, a future delusion that the earth is going to succumb to. And it's a very interesting discussion. When you look at, you watch TV and you hear the political commentators, what happens is, there's this kind of group think, so to speak, where everyone in our culture now in America, you know, certain speech is really not, it's censored, you know, the big uh, Google and companies are, you know, they bury them. Uh, you know, you basically, if you, you have to kind of go in line with globalism and go down this path, otherwise you're, we're, we're not going to, we're going to shout you down, we're not going to allow you to speak. And that's actually dangerous because the United States uh, was formed on free speech and now there's certain speech that's being curtailed in different venues. But if we could go to 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 11, there's this globalism that's going to continue to take place, and this one world globalist leader is going to take over, and uh, he will be so full of himself and have such absolute power that uh, many will worship him as God. But in verse 8 it says, And then the, the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth, which is the end result, which is great, and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Now, this is important because uh, this globalist is going to have a, a religious man, an ecumenist, wants to bring all the faiths together, and he's going to get the religious people on board. Right? The term religion again. So what's going to happen is this Antichrist is going to be able to deceive the secular and the religious alike. Uh, and he's going to, through the power of Satan, which is, the, which is going to increase on the earth, uh, he's going to do things that look like religious miracles. This is why you need to know your word. Right? Somebody says, oh, I, I, there's a statue in my church and blood was coming out of its hands. This is a great thing. Really? What does the word say about that? So, speaks about these power, signs, and lying wonders. Ten, and with all right, unrighteous deception... Right, deceived among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, which is God's free gift of love and salvation, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. The more educated we get, the more things we learn, the more humanity is, you know, making advances in biotechnology and, and you know, education and all kinds of stuff. Uh, the Bible says that we're going to be thrust into the age of information, which we are. The more people will be deceived. You know, I, I look at all kinds of delusions. Ev evolution. 
Yeah, some Christians are, you know, because they don't know where their word, they're frightened into saying, well, we should believe this. Really? God said that he took everything out of nothing in Hebrew bara and created all the elements, put them together and, and caused order to happen. You look at the human body, you look at the snail, you look at the bee, the grasshopper, and you really look at the inc intricacies, there's a design in those insects and in us. But people will believe with all their education that all the matter, the compounds, uh, the elements on the periodic table just all of a sudden appeared out of nothing. Then there was some, you know, it, whatever. There's, there's different theories of the Big Bang. And now they're starting to tailor the Big Bang. And there was this explosion. And then you have the, everything starts to hurl out in space. And before you know it, everything goes from simple life forms to complex life forms. And now you have us. That's a fairy tale. That really takes a lot of faith to believe in, right? Faith. I was debating, a, and it was a nice debate, a biologist once, and he was getting frustrated with me because I was bringing up some arguments, and I didn't have the degrees he had. It was a pride thing with him. He said, I just don't want to talk about it anymore. It wasn't that he was saying, well, you know, your point is flawed, and, and my point is better. He just was getting frustrated because I was trying to find, I was trying to show him all the, you know, the fallacies of, of true science, and even in biology, and he didn't want to continue the conversation. I was nice. I really was. It just, you know, I really was nice. <clears throat> but this is a picture of going through the motions of religion, church rituals, and the end times. Religion will be a big part of the end times, but it isn't going to be in the right thing. <clears throat> Warren Wearsby said this. I love quoting him. He says, it is the heart of the worshiper that determines the value of the offering. Let me add the word religious offering. That's what it means, offering. Read it again. It is the heart of the worshiper that determines the value of the religious or spiritual offering, period. God sees the heart. God sees the heart. Our culture looks at, are you beautiful? Are you wealthy? Are you smart? Do you have letters after your name? God says, I don't care about that stuff. <clears throat> I want to see into your heart. And I can see into your heart. That's what he can do. He knows who's a true worshiper and who's putting on a pretense for whatever reason. Verse 5, continuing on, he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word, which would be his believers. Your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, said, Let the Lord be glorified, that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. The sound of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. So two out of three is God is contrasting. He makes a, a sharp dichotomy, a sharp contrast between those who truly have a relationship with him uh, and those who don't. And what he says thousands of years ago, which we see on a daily basis, I just read about Nigeria, the Christians who were attacked, right? that they just want to worship God. They're not bothering anybody. And their Christianity is usually a minority. And some radical people who are religious zealots killed them. And we see this happening every day in our world. So let's try to understand this, the, the behaviorism, the psychology of it. He says, those who hate their brother, the brother who trembles at God's word, the believer who truly loves the Lord and makes them an outcast. And we can see this in a, maybe, a, listen, in the United States we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of religion, which is awesome, but I can tell you that when I became a Christian and I broke away from the religion I grew up in, I did get mocked by family members, I did get mocked by coworkers, um, and, you know, and then you, you've seen this, you, you've all dealt with this to some extent, and you, you go back at them and say, well, you don't even go to church. Why are you making fun of me? I just want to love the Lord. You know, you don't even go to temple. What are you talking about? And this is what happens. The religious person finds it offensive that somebody breaks free from the religion and actually starts to worship God. It bothers them. Why does it bother them? I mean, there are some obnoxious Christians, but if we're humbly serving the Lord and not shoving it down someone's throat, what's the issue? So God speaks about this. He talks about that. He says, those that say, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy is really a mockery because God says, well, let them be ashamed. And you know that if you have been mocked for your faith, that there are those that will, will tease you and maybe use the word against you. They don't really know the word, but they're just using it. 
So, you know, in Jesus' day, here's the Son of God, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious echelon, the Sadducees were weird dudes, man. They, they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the afterlife. So what do you think happened when they died? But they were, in the first century, they were the ones leading the common people through the religion. And that's why Jesus uh, gave it to them, both barrels, because they were hypocrites. And they were basically telling the people, don't get excited about God. Just be a part of the, the religion. Give us your, your offering. Give us your money. You know, we'll do the, the machinations, and we'll keep the religion going. And Jesus broke into that. He broke through that and exposed it. He speaks about verse 6, the voice from the temple. Now, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, God said, now God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. But he told the children of Israel when they built the temple that he would dwell in that area in the Holy of Holies above the mercy seat. Like it would be, his, part of his presence would be there. And at different times, he would shake the post, depending on what he was doing. He would fill the place with a, a smoke. He would, uh, there would be visions. It's pretty wild stuff. So God's basically saying that eventually I'm going to deal with this situation. The persecuted church, our brothers and sisters, our Ni Nigerian, something that just happened, Nigerian Christians who were attacked, murdered, they got to heaven before we did. We're going to see them. And the beautiful thing is there's not going to be sections I love that about heaven. The diversity is there. All tribes, nations, tongues. You know, we're all going to, it's going to be, it's going to be cool. Worshiping the Lord, seeing the angels, seeing other Christians, maybe hearing their stories. Heaven's going to be a really great place. But God is saying just, just wait a little while longer. I'm going to deal with this. There will be judgment. Now, a little caveat to this is, as Christians, we do not take pleasure in God's judgment. Something that has to happen, he has to judge this earth. There is no Christian who has a heart for Christ and heart for people who is rejoicing over judgment. So you have these groups, and I, I often mention Westboro Baptist. They're the ones who carry the placards at military funerals and stuff. Just hateful stuff. You know, God loves dead soldiers. God hates fags. First of all, none of those two statements are accurate. But... The media loves to pull them up and say, well, this is Christians. You know, Westboro Baptist is really run by one family. It's a very small church. But because they do such weird things, they're in the media. Um, they don't represent Christianity. And I question if they really are submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. First of all, you don't say things like that about people. Okay, you're certainly not going to win anybody to Christ with those placards. And second of all, um, I forgot my second point. It's probably a good one, though. It'll come back to me. That's what happens when you hit 50. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the bottom line is this. We don't take pleasure in judgment. Um, a true Christian never does. A true Christian's desire is to bring people to salvation. Right? Two paths. I spoke about it in my opening. You're on the right path. You don't just go, hey, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm retiring. I'm relaxing. You want to see as many other people be on that path with you. It's not because you're great or I'm great. It's because we've just submitted to Christ and trusted his uh, sacrifice for our sins. And I know for me, I'm sold out. I want to see as many people come with me as possible. And that's what God just put that love in our heart for us. So putting this all in the perspective. Uh, 7 through 14, the last few verses for this morning. He says, Now, before she travailed, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion, uh, Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, travailed, she gave birth to her children. Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery? Says the Lord. I have to stop there for a second. The word Zion Today, you know, people take words and they twist them, right? Born-again Christian. i got to be honest with you. Most people I talk to who aren't Christians, I say born-again Christian, they're like, they make a face. Because some have hijacked that term. It has a spiritual meaning. And this is what the devil does. He takes perfection and he tries to counterfeit it. Um, same thing with Zion. You hear in the news, Zionist, Zionist. And you say, well, Pastor Joe, you're reading about Zion. And I just heard from CNN that <laughs> that's the problem <laughs> right there. 
Because they take these terms and they malign them and they twist them. So then when you go to read the Bible, you cannot interject the culture today, the wacky culture, into the Scripture. It's called uh, eisegesis. You're trying to make it fit with the Word. God's words are timeless. When our culture comes and goes, another one will rise up. The Romans thought they would live forever. So forget about the culture. Culture is decadent. It just means the area around Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, that specific area where amazing things happen, right? Jesus died for our sins, the Holy of Holies was there, and there's all kinds of stuff happened there. Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says the Lord? Shall I, who cause delivery, shut up the womb? This is a rhetorical question, says the Lord. Or the answer is no, if you really follow it through. Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you who love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you who mourn for her, that you may, be, you may feed and be satisfied with the consolation of her bosom, that you may drink deeply and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. For thus says the Lord, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed... On her sides, you shall be carried and be dandled on her knees. A lot of pictures of a mom, a new mom. She gives birth and the way she loves her child, right? I'm going to talk about that too. As one, who, who, as, as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. When you see this, your heart shall rejoice. So the last one is the birth of a new Israel. Okay. <laughs> if you get ten theologians in a room they will disagree subtly with some of the details. What does it mean? So I'm just preparing you. It's a little, it's one of those cryptic, uh, there's a, a main point that Isaiah is speaking of, but some of it is a little hard to decipher. Um, it could be contextual, analogous to the culture at the time. So we can do the best that we can. We all believe and we all understand that this is the birth of this new Israel, this new spiritual Israel. That's in our future. Right now, Israel is in chaos. It's in turmoil. Uh, a lot of things going on over there, but that's not going to be forever. So verse 7, the male child comes before major pain and major travail. This is a picture of the, the, the initial, uh, and these are metaphors. The original metaphor is, is, I believe, Israel giving birth to her Messiah, which is Christ. He comes before the, it's a male child, specific male child, comes before the pain and the travail, the great tribulation, um, Jacob's trouble, all these things that are going to happen in the future. If we could turn to Revelation 12, 1 through 9, and then I'll come back to this. <clears throat> Revelation 12, 1 through 9. The Apocalypse or the revelation given by the Apostle John. Some of these things were future events, some of the th these things were past events, to the present, to the future. Revelation is an often awesome book. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. All symbolism about Israel. Then being with child, she cried out in labor, and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems. This brings us to end times and, and his authority and the numbers having to do with how many nations are involved with this confederation under the Antichrist. His tail drew a third of the stars. This is Satan. He took a third of the angels with him in rebellion. Uh, third, third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. A picture of, you know, Christ is being born into the world and forces of darkness are trying to destroy them. Uh, Joseph and Mary, the flight into Egypt, the escape from Herod, all these things. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Hasn't happened yet. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne, resurrection and ascension. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, we're going into the end times, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days, or the three and a half year period. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Um, so you can see the symbolism 
uh, Israel, all these things kind of taking place. Uh, really neat pictures. But the personification changes. So we're starting out with, again, here's where the confusion lies. Well, we're, I thought it was a child, then it becomes children. What's going on here? What happens is it starts out in this part of the chapter with Israel's giving birth to the Messiah. We know that. Uh, to the earth birthing the new Israel, which we'll see. And Zion birthing to her children, a real major change in Jerusalem. So the second two have yet to happen. Uh, when we look at the Great Tribulation, which is in the earth's future, to the second coming, Zechariah 12, 10 through 11, if we could turn to that real quick. I'm going to tie it all together. <laughs> so Zechariah 12. Now you would think that this was the New Testament. This is the Old Testament. Verse 10, and I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look upon me, the Messiah speaking through the prophet, whom they have pierced. That word dokar in the Hebrew means to run through. It's a picture of the crucifixion. They will mourn for him, because the Messiah was crucified, as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Looking back, right, this is a future reference, looking back and saying, wow, um, down the line, we did this, or we had a hand in this, but it's all good because they're going to nationally look to the Messiah at the second coming and say, yes, we believe. The whole nation is going to be changed. There's a huge number of Israeli believers in Yeshua in Israel as we speak, and the numbers are growing. It's amazing. In that day, there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Raman in the plains of Megiddo. Okay? Verse 9. <laughs> Let's go back to Isaiah 66. So you see these, these metaphors, you see these events that are going to take place. Verse 9, he says, God says, Shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery? Shall I who cause delivery shut up the womb? God made and developed childbirth. So what he's saying is, can a woman carry full term? She's ready to go. She's dilating. And you just stop the process. Oh, that baby's got to come out. So God is basically using another metaphor, right? And he's saying that when I allow all these events in human history to take place, you have to trust me because it's eventually going to be fulfilled. Just like a woman who's come, she's ready, she's ready to go, and you can't stop it. Baby's got to come out. So God is saying, everything that I promise, even though it looks weird from the world's perspective, is going to come to pass. Verses 10 through 11, after the birth of this new spiritual Israel, there's a rejoicing in Jerusalem, uh, and now a continuing metaphor of nursing a child. The pain is over, childbirth, right? The growing, the feeding, uh, the breastfeeding, the maturing process takes place. Verse 12, the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. So you have this Jew and Gentile harmony. Now, if you're new to the scripture, there's a lot of things to explain. Before the first century, really the world was, from God's perspective, was divided up into his people, the Jews who were carrying monotheism, and the rest of the world, the Gentiles, pagans, whatever you want to call them. When the church happened, there was this great inclusion of both. And that's why in the Old Testament we see God signaling to his Jewish people, you better open your minds because there's others that are going to come into the fold. So through Christ, the church became Jew and Gentile. There's actually uh, about a dozen or more Jewish people in this church, and we're not huge. So we worship together. We don't see a difference, right? Jewish people in the world, as far as numbers go, are a minority. Uh, when the Gentiles came into the church, because they were a majority, just numbers, uh, they, uh, it, it seems like it's, oh, you can't be Jewish and be Christian. No, the church started out as a Jewish sect, if you think about it. So we, we have to educate ourselves and stop looking at the culture and what people say. We've got to go back to history, see what God says in history, and see how do we get to this point. Our minds have to change. Uh, so in the age of grace, when people say Jew and Gentile, that's because the cool thing is in the church, we are Jew and Gentile, and we're a, a composite, right? We're mixed. However, when the church is removed in this terrible time period, uh, the Jewish people will take center stage again, and there'll be Gentile nations that are initially 
will somewhat war with Israel, and you can see it now, right? It's, it's, there's, there's a powder keg in the Middle East. But then when the Lord returns, he will make sure that the wars are ended, and then they'll see, you know, the Jewish people, the, the Jerusalem and stuff, will have a mass kind of conversion to the Messiah. And it's just going to be a great time. Even the Gentiles will come in, and they used to fight with each other. Now they're in harmony. And that's what Jesus does. He's the Prince of Peace. Right? We, we still have to wait for the culmination of the peace, but he's still the Prince of Peace. And if you give your heart to Jesus today, you'll see that the things you're struggling with, he can give you that peace on an individual basis. The world's peace is yet to come. Pretty neat. Everything has an order in the Scripture. Verse 13 God will comfort his people like a mother. Now that's another metaphor. So we're taught to believe that God is our heavenly father, so what gives here? God uses metaphors to help us with our human understanding. Is it completely easy to understand the concept of who God is? Not really, because he's God. We can't know everything about him. So what God does is through his word, he shares metaphors with us so we can have a greater understanding. And what you find is that, well, we know this as a fact, talked about evolution before the, the whole childbirth thing that is amazing you know that is i was in the in the room when my son was born and uh what goes on is incredible how god how the baby is in the womb and and there's a cushion and there's a, there's a blood supply and it's just how even the the womb kind of expands and the organs end up shifting in different places and that's just incredible I know some of you ladies are laughing at me, like, yeah, look, a guy trying to explain childbirth. <laughs> I got, I'm doing the best I can, you know, <laughs> I'm doing the, but I, something I'll never experience, but to me, it's, it's miraculous. It's, it is a miracle, if you think about it. Multiple children, how does that happen? Well, I'll tell you this, and this is a lot of fun, too. This is a fact that during labor, childbirth, and breastfeeding, a woman's brain is flooded with the neurochemical oxytocin, right? I got some nurses in here, um, which creates a strong bond between mother and infant. You know, I've seen even young women, they just, they get pregnant, they have a child, and their whole demeanor changes. Like, they're just so in love with this little bundle of joy that they just gave birth to. And, and science is catching up with what God has created. So the oxytocin, there's different chemicals that take place, and uh, this incredible nurturing bond between mother and baby. Fabulous. It, it's fantastic. <laughs> so God is our father. He's not a biological father, right? He's got a spirit. Um, and I have to say this because some have grown up with, listen, I'm not a perfect father. <laughs> um, some of you have grown up with abusive fathers. God's not that type of father. He is all loving, all good. He has our best interests in heart, and he wants to see the best for us. God is spirit, but we also understand as God is our father. Moving on. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, you know, when you, when you start going through this, and, and people new to the Bible are like, wow, you know, I've never seen it from that perspective. I didn't know that God could be so tender in the Old Testament. I didn't know that God could be so intimate. That's why we need to read the Word. If we get our Bible knowledge from CNN or from you know, the History Channel or some theologian somewhere that's wacky, um, we're going to get the wrong impression of who God is. You know, In the 1500s, the Gutenberg printing press came about, and one of the first, I think the first book that was uh, copied was the, was the Bible. And people were actually getting, they were, it was an incredible boom for the printing press, for people to have their own Bibles. In China, you know, they, they, it's, it's illegal. You know, the government tries to crack down on this stuff. And you see these, I've seen these pictures of Chinese people getting a Bible from a missionary. And they all get in their own Bibles. They're holding it. They're in tears. They're crying. They, they got their own Bible. And we in America probably have 10 of them somewhere with dust collecting on them. This is God's word, you know? And when we read God's word, we see what a great God that we have, what a great God that we serve, you know? So I'm just going to end before we close with uh, one of my favorite old-time theologians, Warren Wiersbe, in his book, uh, Be Comforted, about Isaiah. He kind of sums up a lot of things here. He says, throughout his book, Isaiah has presented us with alternatives. 
trust the Lord and live, or rebel against the Lord and die. He has explained the grace and mercy of God and offered his forgiveness. Let me say that and add that it's a free gift of forgiveness. He has also explained the holiness and wrath of God and warned of his judgment. He has promised glory for those who will believe and judgment for those who scoff. He has explained the foolishness of trusting man's wisdom and the world's resources. The prophet calls the professing people of God back to spiritual reality. He warns against hypocrisy and empty worship. He pleads, pleads, God pleads for faith, obedience, a heart that delights in him, and a life that glorifies him. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto wickedness, Isaiah 48, 22. For in order to have peace, you must have righteousness. The only way to have righteousness is through faith in Jesus Christ. If you didn't get Isaiah 53, we covered that some time ago. You, again, you'd think it was the New Testament. It's all about before Jesus came, some 700 years, it gives you incredible details about the Messiah. Like, you, you can see Jesus when you read Isaiah 53. A lot of people haven't read it. This is the Old Testament. So it's pretty exciting. What do we learn from this book? You know, what do we learn from this book? Folks, we all go through things. My wife and I go through things. The other pastors, elders, and their wives. But the, the, what the thing that's the same is that we know who the Lord is. We're grounded in him. He's like a grounding rod. And we always come back, and we're always focused around him. No matter what trial comes in our lives, no matter what move, no matter what sickness, God is always the center of our life. And that brings stability. Before I was a Christian, I didn't have a lot of stability. Um, doesn't make me weak, it makes me smart. Because now I can come to him for counsel, I can come for him to him for comfort, all these things. And my question is, if you've been us for the better part of a year, what has God shown you about your own life through the book of Isaiah? The Bible isn't here to give us a quick fix, because that's the culture does that. This isn't drive-through, you know, feel-good stuff. That's the culture we're a part of. The Bible is there for us to read, to pray about, to, to get applications, and to grow us and mature us. Every single book that I teach, God shows me something. Sometimes I have to strap my seatbelt in because sometimes the lessons aren't exciting. They're not a lot of fun, but they're still lessons. Folks, as I said in my opening, inevitable paths. This entire book, you find me Genesis through Revelation, and I will find you. The Bible speaks about inevitable paths. He's created us. He's given us uniqueness. He set us forth with free will. He tries to draw us back but it's our choice whether we'll follow him or not. And I want to encourage you, if you've been coming to this church and there are other things that you say, well, gee, I like, kind of like what you're saying, I'm kind of interested, but you go back into the world and it's pulling you away again. Something's going on. You can only land on one of the two paths. The wide road that leads to destruction, which many follow, or the narrow road, which few find, but leads to eternal life. It's your decision. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your word as always. We thank you that you do plead with us. You woo us. You court us. You, you just try to get our attention. You try to get us to come to you. It's not that you're weak. It's that you've made us free moral agents. It's our decision whether we're going to go that way or not. And I just pray, as we do every Sunday, if there's anybody here who doesn't know you, and maybe they've been through a religion, maybe they're in a denomination, maybe they feel, because they're a part of something, that they're safe. Some people say, well, I hope I get to heaven. The Bible says you can know that you're going to heaven. It's your choice. So we want to give this opportunity as the worship team does worship. If there's anybody here who doesn't know Christ, as you sit here and I'm speaking, you're honest with yourself and saying, I don't really know Jesus. And don't be ashamed of that because we're going to give you an opportunity to come forward and receive Christ. Just nothing magical. It's he's here. He just, he's everywhere. Just share with him your desire for him. We'll lead you along in a prayer and, uh, and come to Christ. So you come forward. Maybe somebody will walk up with you. You know, don't let this 
gloomy, cold, wet day go to waste, make something good out of it. You come forward.